In the Bible. Would give me an example. Uh -huh. Oh, now you're challenging. Uh -huh. Or maybe not the Bible. I mean, where, where else might we see it? Oh, you see it in today's religious practice in the United States, where, where you got, you know, you got the evan evangelicals, and uh, that get so way out in the right field, um, uh, and then you've got some conservatives, particularly well, Cat Roman Catholic conservatives, like the candidate for the for the uh, Supreme Court is way over here, and uh, yet they're they're still part of a larger body. So, so what is the orthodoxy that 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 the Catholic strident Catholic Church practices? What's the thing? We are the true church. No, it's not the thing. I mean, That's part of it. it. But what is the what is the, the the driver for the Catholic Church and and also in many cases in most cases the fundamental church? What's the one thing that is the litmus test that the, the thing that that causes them to vote for Trump as an example? Abortion. Oh, abortion. 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 It's always abortion, right? So so what's the? Well, abortion? that's not quite true. It's pretty true. Are there many? Do you know many people in the Catholic Church? Who are pro-life and um yeah most of the Seattle prep faculty i think if you looked at it asked them probably, uh, are not pro-life that is i'd be surprised if they were pro-life they might be there might be some catholics that are pro-life but they're not but that's that's a big driver but what's the theology behind uh anti-abortion what's the theology Great life is sacred yeah, right. It's it's the it's and life the, begins at conception. Life. Well, well, that's not the, where it begins is arguable, maybe, but but that it that it there's nothing sacred. more sacred than life. Like that's the yeah. that's the theology, and so since that's the theology, then the uh, and and it, that's, so that's in, in the Catholic way of seeing it, or that's the that's the highest good. Life above all all else is the highest good. Um, so, so how is that practiced then? So what's the, what's the practice around that? How does that play out? Well, I'll give you one example. What? Gary Peters is the hopefully second term Senator from Michigan, who is up in a tough race against a guy named John James, who was malignantly anti-abortion, okay. including victims of rape, incest, or whatever. Right. And he told a story last night about the fact that his wife was pregnant. We saw that. Huh? You saw it? I didn't see it. Go on. Uh, yeah. Wife was pregnant. Baby, I don't remember exactly. At about 16 weeks, the baby quit moving. Clearly, she was going to have a miscarriage. But the OB doc had to say he heard a faint heartbeat. Catholic hospital. But... Baby did not come out in two days. They were trying to get, a, get her to just miscarry. She got sick. Hospital refused twice at least to offer abortion through there. She almost died before she went to another place where they had to do an emergency procedure to save her life. So this is the guy running against the vehemently. And this is, this is, Gary, this is Gary Peters running oh. against this malignant pro-lifer named John mm. James, his wife. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um, so, so one of so one of the prax, the if you believe that to be the greatest good, uh, from a religious, from a God point of view, then what kinds of things do you do in the world? What's the practice? Huh? Well, you you try to prevent everybody else from making this mistake. I mean, they fervently believe that they're saving people. So, so you deny other people their freedom. The, yep. the choice, right? You you make sure people in the legal, like this Amy Barrett, right? That she um, now I'm not I'm, there's no commentary on this just yet, right? But this is what happens, right? If if this is the if burn this, the clinic. What you what'd you say? Burn the clinic. Yeah, you burn the clinic, right? Which is which arrest you, the doctor. You arrest shoot the doctor. Doc. You shoot the doc because. Well, shooting the doc's a little more complicated, but these things are things that are a natural outgrowth. So then if that's the praxis, what is the pathy that comes from that? 
people hurting others. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Division, right? hatred. Division, yeah. hatred, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, Self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, so you see what he's, he might not be intending to talk about this, but if, if something becomes orthodox, that is unorthodox, but it plays out towards something that shatters the kingdom of God, right? So, because at the end, what happens in the orthopraxy is broken relationship, broken. lost freedom, right? And so, the, and, and so I believe that relationship, because of our Trinitarian God, and freedom because of love, are actually higher goods than life. And why do we think um, those are higher goods than life? Because God doesn't honor life so greatly. In what way? Well, people die, first of all. I mean, so first of all, God's not so enamored with life that he doesn't, that she, God, whatever. Doesn't, doesn't, let, it, doesn't, doesn't let it die. God lets everybody die. So, so, so God uh, doesn't see that as bad. Death isn't bad, because otherwise it's like big screw up. <laughs> oopsie, oopsie, dopes. Big inconsistency. Yeah, oops. So, so, so the theology is not very good if life is the ultimate good. Then you have the other complications of, you know, then why do people die, right? Well, because God doesn't actually think death is as bad as we do, right? So... Um, you know, why do people go to war, you know, and because God doesn't necessarily think death is freedom is the thing that plays out in things like war. Well, thou but, shalt not murder is not in the Ten Commandments, obviously, and it's been a hallmark of both all religions for a long time. Why is that? They consider abortion murder, so they don't see a distinction between that and killing somebody that invades your house or whatever. But what is, so that's a good point, Mike. So that's a, that's, why is murder banned? Um, freedom gets kind of lost in the shuffle. Because you break relationship. Right. And, and, right you, 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 and you take away somebody else's freedom. So murder isn't necessarily about the death mm. as, as much as denying somebody their freedom. Because you go back to Jesus, remember? Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the reasons Jesus is constantly traveling is not to get the message out. He's traveling to avoid confrontation with Herod Antipas, right? Because if Herod Antipas catches him, then Jesus has to make a choice. Either I prematurely go with him and do what he wants, or, because my time has not yet come, I have to deny him or his soldiers their freedom to take me. So that's how we know, you know, so and we see that play out because when Jesus all of a sudden decides to go to Jerusalem, what's, it, what's he say? He turns his face to Jerusalem, remember? And the minute he turns his face to Jerusalem, we know that he's ready to forego his freedom in favor of anybody else's freedom to choose how to deal with his life. So that's, that's so that the murder thing, thou shall not murder, is fundamental, but not because of life. It's fundamental because of freedom and relationship. So again, that's where I think that the orthodoxy has become orthodox towards the wrong end, towards division. Now to be fair, perfectly clear, um, you know, your interpretation of, of that is uh, not shared by the Roman Catholic Church? Well, it's not at all. No. But, but so, that was my point. So why would the, Ortho the Catholic Church, why do they value institutionally every single child that's born? Why are they against contraception? What, do, what is that about institution? Well, a lot of movements or groups that, that want to expand power uh, in this world do it in part by expanding their population. Absolutely. And, yeah. mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's... And that's a concern about the Muslims. The Muslims are having more babies than the Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is about power, not life. What's the incentive for the yeah. Catholic Church? More Catholics. 12, 14, 16 kids. That's a good thing. My dad had a patient once, 21 kids. 21. <laughs> she got a letter of gratitude from the Pope. The Lake City near, near Rochester. And she survived. She survived. Oh. You know, she had a couple sets of twins. She had, uh, I think, two kids with, you know, Down syndrome or like she had the whole like perfectly proportionate if you have enough kids, what you're unbelievable. They didn't even know each other, the kids didn't. But same husband too. Oh, uh, but uh, but but so 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 when you so so you start thinking about the, the way these things play out and the theology, once the theology begins to skew towards the institution as opposed to the kingdom of God, then you get division. Right, you get rules that divide. But doesn't the theology in this case get a little thin because we have family members that are super devout Catholics and they've been sending stuff around saying, hey, Catholics, remember, there's other things that we believe like um, mm. taking care of the elderly, immigrants, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I, I view um, what I've seen in the South and... Um, Billy Graham, Son Franklin, and all, as being almost cult-like because they've whipped up these people to believe that they are exercising God's will, and consequently, the venom that they have sometimes is, like it says in the book, um, they've convinced themselves that they are entitled, that they're right, that they should do this, that it's God's will, and I'm not so sure that that's um, espoused by all American Catholics. No, I, I think you're. I think you're right, but I do think that the church has taught this thing. Now, the Catholic Church does tons of great stuff. No question about it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but this is this is a, a key penetrator. This is a key thread. Um, and you know, to the Catholic Church credit, they're also against capital punishment. The consistency with that, at least, uh, uh, unlike the fundamentalist churches, right? Which are, are, you know, anti-abortion and for capital punishment, which is a... Uh, uh, hard to reconcile. Hard to reconcile. So, I, I mean, I, I, a lot of Catholic theology is really good, but this particular point is, is pretty fundamental um, in, many, in many Catholic people's lives. Now, they may not play it up, right? And, and for many of them, it's not their guiding principle. But it just gives us an example of how this chain of reasoning works once it gets sideways, but mm -hmm. becomes their orthodoxy. But the change in orthodoxy in an institution, it points out that usually results from a change in the people that are part of that religion or organization. And that has to come from the ground up. And, uh, and uh, to, so for the institution to change, the people below usually change and then force the institution to make a change. So what kinds of things do we do at Epiphany or in the Episcopal Church where we are unorthodox? Like, so it's easy to pick out the Catholic Church. That's like a big yeah. part that you can't hardly miss. Well, women priests. Women priests. Uh, women bishops. Uh, oh, now, today, today. Same-sex marriage. Well, it's, it, it's very interesting. If you turn in the book to page 133. I can do it. Uh, and I found this to be fascinating, speaking of same-sex marriage. Here. About, about these little charts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and now over time, more and more participants are attracted uh, to the safe space, and eventually its area of influence includes more and more territory within each of the church structures. The forces of growth and renewal that the institution rejects find uh, safe space to grow outside its boundaries and eventually 
brings its resources to the institution that it rejects. So when I'm reading that, all I could think of was gay marriage. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what happened in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Right? It hasn't happened in the Roman Church. It may, but, but right, it, it just first of all, the recognition of LGBTQI people, and then the, the, the marriage, and then the priesthood, like all of those things flowed once the space became large enough within the church. Or even in the culture. I mean, you know, sort of the speed at which it went from total ostracism, you know, victim, terrible situation to accepted mainstream Supreme Court passes the, the equal rights of marriage was pretty quick, right? But enough space had been created here. You think the Roman church is changing enough that that's going to happen in our lifetimes? I doubt it. I don't know. It's hard to say, Mike. I mean, um, I, uh, if, they get a, if, I, they get, so. if they get back-to-back popes, like Francis, mm -hmm. like get another that's, that's one possibility. I like agree. Francis, uh, that's like Francis but younger. There may be some significant things that change. I mean, you know, the 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 challenge of the Roman Church is that their capacity to control the conversation's gone away uh, because this, because this is an internet world, right? I mean, Royal institutions, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Mm. So when people look around, they start to wonder. Um, well, if, American Catholics have been ignoring Pope Paul's encyclical against contraception forever. The song. Your point. Yeah, yeah. Many, which is why we call them cafeteria Catholics. Right. <laughs> is that what we call them? Yeah. 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 I, I, was, I was struck in that, near that same page because I was about ready to ask that question when, when then he did in the book, which is, so where is the Holy Spirit in this, inside the church or outside the church? And it, the answer is both, which I, and again, in, in culture, and, and back to that topic of gay marriage, it, it appears, in retrospect at least, that the Spirit was moving both within the culture and within certain parts of the, the church writ large. So where, back to the question, is there anything that you see or suspect in the orthodoxy of our church now, not, you know, before we had women priests or LBGTQ, I mean, is there any hunk of, uh, that, that sort of our equivalent to, you know, gay marriage 15 years ago or whatever? Any blinders? I'm asking this in earnest because, uh, uh, you know, I don't have a, I don't have something that I'm going to throw out there. Um, that has become really, um, really big yeah. for us. I mean, thoughts? Well, I think our issues with authority are still an issue. I mean, you had all these big evangelical churches not so long ago breaking away from the Episcopal Church because primarily over gays, finding bishops in Africa to put them put under their wing. Um, so I think that's possibly one issue that's still an issue for, well, probably not for us because we are part of the main line of physical church and we swear some sort of allegiance to the presiding bishop and beyond. By the way, Marcus Welby preached a fabulous sermon at the Washington Cathedral, National Cathedral three weeks ago. I can send that link around if you want to read it or yeah. listen to it. There's, there's two things that jump to my mind, maybe as I think about it now. One is that only priests can um, consecrate the host. Mm -hmm. right? They've changed that in Australia. I can see why. Silly. Yeah. But that's, um, that's, uh, that's, one, um, that's one thing that, that's, that exists in our system. Um, Do you here see any movement for the laity wanting to change that? I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure they care. I mean, you know, I'm not exactly. sure. I mean, there's enough. There's enough movement around that. Like, I think there's, in some ways, there's there's probably something about that that people like, right? That that is what their priest does. So, yeah. and, and um, so and maybe it's not that that big, right? I mean, it's provides job security for priests. Well, it does. <laughs> Al. I mean, in all seriousness, it does. 
Uh, the question is, how many priests do you have? I mean, I, I think we have more priests than we have physicians, don't we? Uh, I don't think so. Getting close. <laughs> I, uh, it's. But in the Catholic Church, in the Roman Church, that's it really is an issue because you have fewer and fewer priests in the in the Roman Church. So who's going to do the the rites of the church uh, mm -hmm. if you're in some rural area somewhere? You know, pastor up at St. Bridget's in Laurelhurst is from Vietnam. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Father Akumo, who was up here for a long time, is from Nigeria. I mean, they, they really are. Pretty so we're stealing priests from places that need them more than we do because they won't liberalize the process here to produce more clergy for the congregations that we have. That's, ex that's exactly right. So, so, so um, that's one I was thinking about. One is that maybe the hierarchy of the, the church, right? I mean, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, the bishops and the necessity of bishops and uh, um, in, in that role, but it's sort of in the same vein, it is, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a dividing um, attribute. Well, if you look economically, how much uh, of a parish's uh, money goes to the diocese, for what return, a lot of people would question. Uh, and yet, uh, and, and a lot of parishes aren't as fortunate as ours, and are economically distressed. Um, and getting help. What, what does the diocese really do for the average parish? And uh, if it doesn't do much, then why do we need diocese and why do we need uh, bishops? Yeah. They, they were congregationalists. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the, you're right. I mean, the bishops were historically and still do redistribute well. Um, and we give non-transactionally, like the, we get very little back from what we give. Um, and, and, and that's, but you look at a lot of, in our parish, it's not dissimilar in a way, right? I mean, we don't charge for things. It's, it's disproportionate, <laughs> um, you know, the giving. So it's, uh, any other thoughts on, on this? This was, uh, this is a this is a good way to think about it, and I do invite you whenever you're talking to your Catholic friends, say what's the highest good, like what's the 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 most important, the theological aspect of your, and see how many say life. You know, um, and I'm not against life. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, let's. But, but, um, Glad to hear but, it. Good to but hear. I, but I also wouldn't argue. <laughs> that it's the highest theological point of orientation. Well, you told uh, me Friday that it was just transitional. It is just transitional. That's yeah, so therefore, if it's only transitional, then, then, you know, it's not a big deal. Well, that's what the martyrs believed, right? That's why they were able to like, yep. go, you yep. know, they, I mean, and that's what made, that's what made them entirely fierce in peace, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a community of people that are willing to die and not fight back, the impact of that is unstoppable. It is an unstoppable action. It's like a Muslim with a uh, 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 explosive vest. No, no, it's much more powerful because you're not killing other people also. Oh, okay. Right, so the, the power of that is you're not actually um, taking other people's lives. You re you're, you're allowing other people to continue to have their freedom, but you've made, you've freely chosen to go this way. To change the world. Yep. It, it, yeah, it brought Rome to its knees. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, Dwight, before we maybe leave this, um, I don't have any other misconstrued orthodoxies to, to throw in the mix. But what I'm wondering about is, and those you cited, um, again, as someone newer to the tradition, strike me as possible, and they're, they're more about sort of how we worship. But if I think back on gay marriage, I think back on abortion, you can argue, and, and some would say the evangelical tradition, you know, made that into a social issue, a political issue to, to take power. Um, in fact, there are articles that suggest that. But my point is, it feels like the thing to watch for is social issues that can become, you know, religious issues. And so I wouldn't claim that, you know, capitalism or not is, or that, you know, climate change or not is. I think those are true things. But it does seem like the, the thing that I'm taking from this is to watch and discern between 
those that are, quote, just social issues that we need to engage with, and those that are sort of fundamental, either theological or, um, yeah, theological issues, and, and distinguish between those two. Otherwise, we can go down that same path that the evangelical church has for 40 years, mm -hmm. only to, to claim power. So it's an interesting point. It's a great insight, and it's something I, I struggle with uh, a little bit in leadership and in teaching and in preaching, is, is this idea that, um, th that maybe we don't take a stand for fear of it being toward an unorthodoxy, mm, yeah. the, right? The hard uh, the word orthopraxy. So, so because, you know, um, so Black Lives Matter, right? There's mm -hmm. plenty of old school churches that have huge Black Lives Matter uh, banners hanging, uh, hanging from the rafters, mm -hmm. and, and we don't. Right, so do we not, because I'm afraid of it being an unorthodoxy, or do we not, because I'm afraid of the impact it would have on some parishioners and their giving and their support yeah. of the church, or do we not, because I understand that it's an idea that uh, um, breaks relationship, or do we not, because I'm afraid to say, if that breaks relationship, then you have bad theology because it's about freedom. Yeah. So. It's hard. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. So, so there's some people that jump right into the next political um, thing, and then the next one after that, and the next one after that, and pretty soon, you know, you're five things down the way, uh, and you still haven't finished with the Syri Syrian refugee problem over here, or, or the, the, the Ethiopian problem over here, or whatever the last thing you were on, right? And you just keep streaming it down. Or there's something like Black Lives Matter that's maybe fundamental. It could be, yeah. Well, and to belabor that and then we can move. or do you, do we not put up a banner on that because instead we are going to engage in deep dialogue out of relationship with one another in the hopes that that may help us find a way to actually make a difference there right and so it's that, that's well, another reason what i do with, with that is i say okay we're going to teach this stuff mm -hmm. and then you decide right. but that also could be cowardly I actually think it's more powerful that we're doing this sacred ground. And by the way, for some reason, Sophie's my video, Hi, Sophie. my, vi my video is not working. I didn't see um, you. Sorry, okay. I'm here. Um, what I would video. say though, is that um, I think the sacred ground, the fact that 90, what is it? 90 people are participating yeah. in that. To me, that is super powerful and more powerful. I mean, I walk my dog a lot in my neighborhood and there's a lot of signs up. I have to say there's a part of me that feels like it's so, um, it's so easy to put a sign up, yep. right? It almost feels, I actually would, I don't want to do it because I feel it's embarrassed to do it actually in a way. It's sort of like I'm on the bandwagon or something like that, as opposed to what am I really doing about it? Um, anyway, there's one more thing I wanted to add, which is um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and there's one on NPR that's called Through Line, And they did an excellent one on the evangelical vote. I really recommend it to everybody. It goes to the whole history of even the evangelical movement. And a lot of it is what you touched about earlier, Dwight, it was about power. And even the fact that they took on the abortion topic, th there's, a, there's a, a method to the madness, if you will. You know, it's not necessarily true beliefs. I mean, maybe it becomes a belief over time, but there's, a, there's definitely a, an agenda. That's how I would put it. So I recommend that to everyone. Well, but it speaks, Sophie, it speaks to what happens, right? So slavery, because we're talking about this a lot at church, and we should be, um, is uh, it, there's a method to the madness, right? I mean, we need to pit one group against the other group so we can control this pot, right? Over time, people really became to, ha came to hate Black people, right? They really mm -hmm. came to believe that they were lesser. But that came way later right, than the intent for, for economic power that started the whole process in the first place. They, 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 they needed the power, then they had to create the movement or the mentality. You know, maybe similarly with anti-abortion, right, in mm -hmm. the evangelical church, right? They, they needed the power and now they've created it. And so people truly in their hearts weep. And, and I mean, I think there's sincere people that honestly are out there protesting um, uh, facilities that provide the service to terminate, you know, a fetus, right? So you, you don't want to deny that, but that, but they've been trained to respond to the power, um, and that's um, that's a, you know that is uh, that's how it works, um, and, and we can even see it in our current political life. I mean, 
uh, many thoughtful and great leaders of government um, are, are well cowed by the president um, who had spoken out against you know, him and, and now they're absolutely shifted because of his capacity to the way he exerts power. Um, it's, it's a thing. We're going back to the church for a minute. I did not finish chapter eight last week, so I finished it this week. And at the end of chapter eight, and I don't, I'm on Kindle, so I can't find page numbers. He talks about this balance between faith and action. Let's just leave it at that, where you've got spiritual development, formation on this side, care for the world, mission, and let's name it justice on this side. And he makes, I think, a very good case for the fact that those two ought to be in balance and equally valued. And as, for as much as good things are going on at our, at our community now, I think we still aren't in balance in that regard. So what would balance look like? Well, it might look for starters like not, we, you know, I don't know when the last time except for the environment uh, forums that we did a year ago that we're doing anything in everybody hour except talking about formation and theology. That's it. So more education on those particular topics. Yeah, I don't, I don't have, pretend to know which ones we should pick. I don't think that means we'd flip from one to another, but we used to, it was not that long ago when a fellow named David Domke, who was a political science professor at the U, who gave several forums at our place and was really, really, really good. He was an excellent, he is very perceptive. And I think I would vote if we could vote to get it now to get him in here after the election to talk about it. So, for so example, you, I know David Domke. I've had coffee with him. Um, and, and, uh, and he runs, you know what he's doing now. Got a foundation going or something. Got a foundation uh, where he is uh, a huge um, activist to get Trump out of office. Well, of course. <laughs> right, right. Which is fine. Like, you know, I can, you know, I, hard to imagine how that's not a bad idea, but some people believe it is a bad idea. Because right? they believe in Trump. Yeah. I mean, there's some people who really, really believe in his story and, um, and some go here to this church. Um, so, uh, um, and, and I have to say, uh, you know, in my observation over the last week <laughs> on a couple of different pastoral issues, these guys are really spun up, the, the, the Trump people who live in Seattle. They're super uh, thin-skinned right now and really nervous and uh, high, high levels of anxiety. I see that play out in other places, but, but the what? common thing that I'm seeing among these people. Is that just because they think he's going to lose or because no, no, they're no. upset that people don't like him besides themselves? I, I don't know the answer to that because I, I don't see it play out as, a, in, as in that conversation. I'm seeing it play out other places with people who I do know are Trump supporters. Well, it's not, this so. is not as big an issue as I think it was not that long ago, but I've had the distinct impression that a not too large group of people with, who give us lots of money think that anything besides spiritual development in a chapel of ease means politics, which they won't support. Well, that's fair enough. Well, that's interesting. Not, um, that doesn't mean you've had, you're supposed to get up in the pulpit and tell us who to vote for. Well, no, but, but that means is you why... talk about justice in a Christian context, and there's lots of stuff to do with that. No question about it. I hope we talk about that sometimes. I know Ruth Ann's preached some good sermons on that. and you're get, You guys are doing better. Thank and I did that service on uh, series on politics in the kingdom of God. Um, yeah. Um, well, and what, excuse me, which, which you said, the whole point of all of that is what can I do for you? Now we have to broaden that into a community context and say, what do we do for everybody else? Second amendment, second commandment type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, second commandment. And um, I, I'm trying to, I'm, I don't mean to undersell what's going on right now because we are, as service and outreach have raised a very large amount of money from people who know that there's people hurting out here. And we got right now as much money as we need, but don't and, tell everybody else that. And, from all, <laughs> and, and I have to say, in, in all fairness, Mike, from every corner 
of the political spectrum in our church. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, I think the question of human need is separate from the question of it's that's it. He he does he does a very good rendition of what Gene Robinson first said about people floating down the river until you finally decide you need to go up the stream and find out why they're getting thrown in the river in the first place. Yeah, and that's and and I'm not and and I think you know I also would say that those are fundamental kingdom of God issues um, that that transcend politics and I. I also think that irrespective of political consideration in this parish, people get that, even if they're Trump supporters. Like, they, they, um, I, I see that kind of support here too, right? That's so. That's that's the idea that we can get to the other side of um, particular political things. Now, stuff gets politicized pretty quickly. You know, like face masks, for example, got politicized very quickly. <laughs> And entirely unnecessarily, right? I mean, there, there was there was no reason in, in all of Christendom that that should become a political issue. Uh, it was like, if you think about it sort of in retrospect, like, how did that happen? I mean, good Lord. Well, Trump failed at the coronavirus, and now he's saying, let's let all get, everybody get sick and be, hopefully we get herd immunity. Yeah. So um, he's likely to pass a national ban on mask wearing under those circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm serious, but, but it really is. Um, it is interesting how that let's, I want to, I want to, I want to flip through some of these other ones um, and see what other, or ask, see what other questions you have. Oops, I'm going the wrong way on my slide. Um, let's, this was one that was uh, sort of interesting. Um, how, uh, <laughs> How does I got all this stuff in the way? I can't read my own question. How does the idea of individually practicing a musical instrument versus playing with an orchestra reflect the same kind of relationship between individual spiritual dis disciplines and worship? Hey, Jerry, how are you? Fine. Good. I finally got the book. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> um, any thoughts or experience with that? No, oh, I think they're parallel. You become personally talented to lend your talents to the community. And then pretty soon, you know, an orchestra has everybody who's talented, so it isn't quite the right analogy. But you have to do the, the first part first before it works. That's true. Yeah, which it, it feels like preparation for me um, that by, by preparing, by practicing individually, when I then engage with a broader orchestra. Um, it's a better experience both for me and for the people I'm playing with. And I, th I think that extends to worship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so what's it been like not having worship? Uh, I think <laughs> it's uh, the lack of... Um, Horrible. Even, not good. <laughs> even when we did virtual, uh, the virtual is good. But again, all that's doing is, is helping us as individuals. Uh, you lack the sense of community. And uh, that sense of community is supportive for each individual. And it also sort of makes you feel like you're participating in something that is more likely to be creative and more likely to be uh, influential uh, uh, than if you do it on your own. Mm. On your community. <laughs> That's a community of two, not a community of 400. That's good. That's good. Like the difference between um, working out by yourself and then working at a gym with a buddy and lifting weights, you know, and you, there's that whole different you, to cadence and, and stuff. Um, I um, are in a class. Yeah, or in a class for sure, just reading the book. How about this question? This really struck me. Did you like this one, Doug? Yeah. Did you came across this one? And, and I think close to that is where he talks about paraphrasing. The best time to go to church is when you don't want to, mm. or the inverse mm -hmm. of this, um, which mm. sadly resonated with me. <laughs> so. <laughs> what do you mean? Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, in which part? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 his statement 
um, when I think about, I guess why why we why we gather in worship, why we gather communally. Um, for me, quite often, it would when I wouldn't want to go, it would be to not be around others, which I think was because I didn't feel prepared, which is because I think I wasn't engaging in some of these practices. That's sort of a thin thread to pull all the way through. That's probably a little too personal, but that's that's what I took from that comment. And I think the inverse of that is this, which is um, just showing up, you know, different motivation, but same outcome, which is it's not all that useful. Spiritual malpractice. I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I think good. that being in this community is is just nourishing. And so that if you go enough times, at least, you know, maybe this is how I see it, though, that you'll take some kernel out of that every time you go. And of course, as a child going to church every Sunday, I didn't feel that way. You know, I felt it was a drudgery or whatever. And, you know, I fought with my sister or whatever the heck it was. <laughs> But as an adult, I, mean, I think what you said, Doug, makes sense. The fact that you push yourself to go because at the end of the day, you know, you do get something out of it. Right. Yeah, that's, where, that's what I'm trying to suggest. Yeah, you, you do benefit. Are, are you disagreeing with McLaren on this statement? Well, do you only benefit? So here's the question, right? Do you only benefit if it is um, uh, right and well-ordered worship? Right. So, 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 so let's pretend that Epiphany um, today is right and well-ordered worship. So you don't want to come to church, but when you do come, you know, you, you, it's, it's like when you're lifting weights, right? You got your posture right and you're bending your knees right. And so it all works because you got the system that's working. So even though you didn't want to go to the gym and pump iron, you got a coach that's keeping you formed, right? Or even though you didn't want to go to church on Sunday morning, you have good formation. Whereas, and, and this is what I see often, sadly, I see a lot of people my age that don't go to church because they, I believe, might have gone to poorly formed churches um, that actually Not caused formed. them to never want to go to church again, even if it was slightly off, right? And so it makes me, you know, think that the form of the worship itself is super important to to work irrespective of the um, uh, the desire to go. So Sophie, to your point, I think you're right. Um, and if you grew up in a church, even if you didn't want to go, if you were getting good form, uh, now as an adult, it's easy to go back to church. Does it make sense? Maturity. Well, we certainly got in our share of people burned out of the Roman Catholic Church, not to pick on just them. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, Mike, and, and so you, that sort of brings you to the point of spiritual malformation. I mean, was there Correct. theological, like I can't tell you how, how many folks um, I've met along the way who say, my church told me I was bad. They mm -hmm. told me that my sexuality was bad. That's spiritual malpractice leading to malformation that drives them out of the church. So, so I'm not just talking about good kneeling and standing and crossing yourself at the right time, though those things are super important. Um, I'm talking about, I'm talking about I'm still learning. Yeah, I see a mic. It's very painful to watch. It's, uh, sometimes your left hand. Uh, um, it's um, I love the act like to do this. You see them up there and they look over at me and they're like, oh my God. <laughs> awesome. um, but that hopefully that's not malformation. Um, so it's keep it's keeping it it's keeping it. Uh, I think because churches can do more harm. Um, than, well, uh, back to the politics question. And Anne was going through RCIA to be a Roman Catholic when she was in college down in Salem. So we went down several times. For, she's also playing basketball, so we went down for games, and then the next morning we'd often go to church with her and the it was one one service where the only which was the only time I came within an inch of walking out when this preacher from the pulpit preaching what was supposed to be a service was exhorting the troops and whipping them up to go to a big right right to life mount rally in Portland sometime soon. Right. Right. And um right and so people that believe that's the highest good are, are willing to do that. Right. Um, and, uh, and other people, like there are people who've had abortions who were sitting in that room right there, um, who were, 
who were thinking, we, we had that issue once. The only time I've ever pulled a preacher aside here in, in my entire- <laughs> I remember this. My entire time here is uh, he got off script. He never had a very good script, which is the reason we require people to keep scripts when they preach. Um, <laughs> they started talking about this abortion uh, situation and this woman and abortion. Like he went on and on. It was eight o'clock service. Um, and uh, 25 minutes. You remember that? Were you at yep. that service? I was. Oh, Lord. it was terrifying. And, uh, and all I could think was, that I'm sure there are people in this room that have had abortions. And sure enough, I mean, you know, know, know that to be true and for all whatever reasons. And, um, and she I, was on a pro choice rant. No, it, no, it was a pro-choice rant, but the way it was laid out, Mike, was... A, no, I know, but... It was, it was complicated, fair. right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you really, you know, um, I, asked him, I, I asked him to entirely change his sermon between services. And he wasn't trying to do that. It was entirely unintentional, right? Totally unintentional. Um, but it's uh, things... And that's the other thing. Spiritual uh, uh, malpractice can be unintentional. Right. If, uh, so that's, that's tricky. Um, so one of the things that uh, McLaren talks about, let me let's see if I can go back here. Um, I don't know what this computer. I only read the, the 15th chapter. So let's see. <laughs> so he talks, is he talks about, um, how do we get this? You guys, can, can you guys see that? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Sort of. There we go. Um, yeah. So he talks about exercise equipment in a health club and what would correspond to these spiritual exercises. Can you see that, Margie? Or is that too small? It's fine. Um, and I thought that was sort of an interesting exercise since I talk about Epiphany as a gem for the human spirit. Um, and, and what are the things, uh, that we do, um, you know, and I guess maybe, uh, maybe it's not, this is not worth our time. Um, before you leave that list, yeah, if you don't mind, I, I thought to me, that was interesting. I, this, this, um, chapter was really, really thought provoking, but I had not thought of feasting and celebration. I'm not sure what equipment that's like. I, I can make one up, but I hadn't really thought about that as part of, um, you know, sort of the contemplative tradition. I thought of it as more, I just thought of it as different. So it was nice, it was nice to see it there because I love that. I think feasting and celebration is important. So more just an observation. And, and you know what I might do with that, Doug? Hmm. Um, I might take feasting and celebration and fasting and self-denial and make them two points under holy days and seasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the rest yeah. is like, hey, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little more celebrating tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> celebrating discipline. By uh, itself it's bad, it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, let's 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 go down to the bar again and celebrate. Yeah. Um so so I think I think putting it in the context of a, of a bigger pattern, um I think it, at least to my mind, makes that make more sense. Uh, agree. And let me be clear, I wasn't advocating for just that practice <laughs> in isolation. I was simply saying that, and to your point, the notion of holy days and seasons feels to me like a communal thing in some ways. All over the world on a given day, we're, we're thinking about this or doing this. So it was more just, um, didn't think of it as part of this, this body of practices. But I agree with you. We do a pretty good job after the Easter vigil of feasting and celebrating. Indeed. Uh, and the late night Christmas Eve uh, and that. that, but, but I would say, um, the thing that is super, uh, lovely about, uh, fixed feast days and celebration days and fixed fast days is that, um, they force us into a mood that we may or may not be feeling right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that, that creates, that works a muscle, uh, that allows us to be empathetic to people who may be feeling either celebratory or in the doldrums. And so the beauty of the calendar is the forced mechanism that it allows us to experience. So to create sort of a body of empathy worldwide um, through the body of Jesus Christ. And so it's, 
It's not just about what I feel, but it's about my capacity to feel into the body. And then the great thing about that, I had somebody in my office years ago, you probably heard me tell this story, who came in and slumped down in this chair behind me and said, I am in Lent. <laughs> said, it's July. You can't be. In well, we know what that means. <laughs> right. But it was total Lent for them. And, and that was beautiful. And, and they knew they were in Lent because they'd experienced Lent. But what did they also know because they were in Lent? They'd come out of it. Resurrection. They know, they, know the, they know the resurrection, right? That, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And so, so when that person was in here, we talked resurrection. <laughs> yep. I mean, Lent was Lent. Like you couldn't get out of it. When you're in Lent, you're in Lent. You're, you're either in it or you're not in it. Yeah, you got to fix that. <laughs> he was in it, right? There's no coming out of Lent when you're in Lent. But Take it 20 days instead of 40. We do know, we're going to change it this coming year anyway, Mike. Uh, we're doing fasting every Wednesday and Friday. Are you serious? <laughs> no, just me and you. Okay. <laughs> just, just, just me All and right. you. Be done. I'll do that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, th that's, uh, that's the beauty of, of that, um, uh, that way of that, uh, the, the liturgical calendar. Is what it, what it yep. does to us, even if we're not in the mood or thinking about it, because it allows us to have to be less intentional about our lives in, in a, a sort of wonderful way, in a, a weird way. Oh, yeah. He talked about the donuts. <laughs> what are the donuts? I would not have the same re, re, uh, self control that he had once he started Took on. a bite. Yeah. Yep. Wouldn't work. Garbage. What are you? What are you? What's your donut? Donuts, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Among other what things. What are the things that get in the way of your spiritual exercises? Yeah. How about for you, Jerry? Uh, wanting to do something else. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, right? Um. Uh, Yeah, it, sometimes there's always something else I want to do or need to do. So at the end of the evening, I end up starting my Bible study in prayer about between seven and eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I start falling asleep. <laughs> so it's really not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, exhaustion from the day. Yeah. Exhaustion can get in the way for sure. Other thoughts? I think for me, when it comes to the missional category of exercises, it's it's probably fear, fear of you know not doing it right. If I'm encountering a group of people that I don't understand, right, or or know how to deal with, or fear of yeah, I think in in that part of the practices, it's 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 probably fear. Mm -hmm. I'd say for me, it's, um, I'm always thinking of the next project. So I find myself in my prayer life thinking about anything, right? Next capital campaign, next... When's that going to be? Next... <laughs> well, Mike, let me tell you, I've been thinking about it. Um, the, uh, like, you know, just stuff, like what we do, like just, and, and, and I'm planning and, and I, I find that I'm not attending to God. And you know what I do uh, when I find myself in that place in my prayer life? It's, I do it all the time. I take my hand and I put it right here on my carotid thing. Right <laughs> and then I listen to my I listen to my heartbeat, right? And then I and then I match the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy mm -hmm. on me, to the beating of my heart. And that's and so that that gets me out of whatever I'm planning, and it takes me back to that pattern. Um, so that's that's just don't press too hard, or your pulse will go way down. <laughs> I won't press too hard, Mike. Sometimes I do it on my wrist, right? Uh, sometimes I can just hear it in my chest, but it's it's getting back to the present. Is the thing that us up. So I know Diane uh, ha and Sophie have EFM. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. Great discussion. Thank you. Yes, great discussion. I love these. Let's have a quick prayer, uh, and then 
And then, Jerry, you can go and finish your prayers early enough. <laughs> How many chapters for next Thank week? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next week, the way we're doing it next week is we're just going from 14 to 21 or whatever the last chapter is. Okay. okay. Um, and, then, and then the week after that, uh, we'll just sort of wrap it up a little bit. Or 20, 14 through 20. So I'll, I'll throw out questions just like this. Is that okay? And, yes. And you all bring in your own as well. Let's pray. Great. Jesus, you're a great God. You uh, bring us together. You call our hearts to you. You, you form us and you reform us uh, in the patterns of worship and to prayer and other things. Um, they call our hearts to you. Bless each one of us as we go forth in this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Peace, guys. It was great to see you. Be well. Good night, everybody. Take care. Thank you.